our evangelical friends who might be listening to this, you you have a way of reading scripture, yes. Uh, the Catholic Church has a way of reading scripture in its tradition, yes. There's in fact another way of reading scripture out there at the moment, which is thoroughly academic. And uh, yes. the academic approach to reading scripture, um, some Catholics, and I'm again, this is a mea culpa, have forgotten our ancient way of reading scripture. Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show is Catholics and the Bible. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by a colleague, former colleagues, and present colleague in a different way, David Schutz, joining us from the People's Republic of Victoria. Welcome, David. <laughs> Hello there, Peter. Hello, everybody. Now, I've invited David back because in response to our Why Be Catholic episode, we had a number of responses from people who didn't listen to the episode, but came back with answers of, well, because the Catholics do this and that and this, we'll address each of the different concerns that were raised in different episodes. But one of the major concerns raised is uh, that Catholics are non-biblical, that they don't follow the Bible. And um, I thought, in fact, I said in the thread, it might be a good idea for an episode that uh, we talked about it. And as David and I talked a little bit offline about this, we ended up deciding, I think, on about seven episodes. <laughs> we, we don't know where we'll end up. But what we definitely agreed on is that we need to start with a conversation about how Catholics, where does the Bible fit in the Catholic Church, how does it work? And because it's not exactly the same as the experience we had in various Protestant communities, and and it needs to be said as a as a starting point where Catholics start with the Bible and why it's important, and so so that we can have mutual understanding in that way. Now, just by way of disclaimer, David and I met when we were both Lutheran ministers in Melbourne, and uh, we shared a lot of. Um, time actually over the Bible, because I think we, we spent the most amount of time when a, a small bunch of us had decided that translating the New Testament from the Greek was getting a little boring, and we decided to do it from the Latin instead. <laughs> we, met, we met weekly to translate from the Vulgate, and we began asking questions at that time. Why did Jerome translate it this way? And then I remember a colleague of ours uh, brought in a catechism, and we said, what, what's that? He said, oh, well, I was wondering if it matches what the Catholics say now. And that sort of was the almost the final stage of our journeys. But the point is, is that we're gathered around Scripture as Lutherans. Before I became a Lutheran, we were gathered around Scripture as Brethren and Baptist and Pentecostals and all these sorts of groups. But we do it in different ways. Growing up, I had you know hundreds and hundreds of memory verses, um, 200 a year I had to memorize to get the little prize they had. And it was definitely the way they measured whether you were a good Christian, how well you knew the Bible. What attracted me to the Lutherans was that they took Bible scholarship seriously. And it would have to be said, David, that the majority of our seminary training was focused on the scriptures. Very large amount of it, including two full years of both Hebrew and Greek. Yes, indeed. And and once you had finished the the you know Greek one, two, three, you then went on to do exegesis, Greek exegesis one, two, three, um, which meant that you spent, you know, a good three years in the end in Greek scriptures and a three years in Hebrew mm -hmm. scriptures. And uh some of us, including our colleagues that shared that meeting in Melbourne with us, jumped aside and did some Latin as well. It's probably worth um saying at the start here that uh, in the way that we as Lutherans were trained, the emphasis on biblical texts and starting with the scriptures, um, you know, for pastoral ministry, not just for um, being theologians, is interesting when you compare it to perhaps the way that Catholic priests are prepared at their seminaries. What they start off with is a whole year of philosophy. Um, and then integrate into a philosophical um, understanding uh, the doctrinal and scriptural uh, the theology of the church. And this is a slightly, this is a different approach. And I'm realizing that now doing my master's degree, that I'm actually not as philosophically trained as I should be, but, but also bringing scripture and philosophy together, integrating them in a way so that what we read in the scriptures matches up with our real lives 
and our experienced lives um, is actually quite an important thing within the Catholic tradition. It is. Um, interestingly, the Lutherans would claim, and I think definitely in my brethren life, they would claim that as opposed to the scholarly study of Scripture, they preferred to see the Scriptures applying to real life. That would be their catchphrase. You know, it's about real life application. And almost every Bible study was actually a, like a form of catechesis where they kind of gave you sort of a moral lesson from the various parts of the Bible affirming, you know, the doctrines they had, rather than a genuine sitting down with the Bible and saying, what's going to happen today? Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of genuine openness to the to the Scriptures. Literally the difference between what we call exegesis mm. and eisegesis. Can we unpack that a little bit? There, there's two different ways, uh, as I mean, there's many different ways, but there's two different approaches to Scripture, one of which reads what we want the Scriptures to say onto them. Like we, we think, for example, I, I have an argument with David. I think I'm right. I go looking in the Bible for all the verses that prove that I'm right. Now, that's a way of reading the Bible in a sense that I'm imposing my meaning on it rather than opening the Bible to say, well, I wonder what God has to say. I, I think the difficulty here is the question of how we are addressed by a text. And I'm, I'm going to be just a little bit philosophical for a minute because whether you are picking up the Bible or whether you're um, picking up Dickens' great expectations or whatever, you're, you're reading a text and you're interacting with that text both your personal experience and your community experience, and um, how that text interacts with you personally and with your community does differ depending on that experience you're bringing to the text. I'm aware of this. I've done a lot of work in interfaith relations, and it, as I have often sat down with Jews and read the Old Testament texts, the same texts that we have, and seen that they read the, the same scripture very differently from the way we read it because of a different community experience with that text. Um, there's also, David, coming back to your earlier point, there's also a philosophical difference because um, it, it's not, I mean, yes, our community shapes us, and certainly in my community the biggest issue was not what the Bible said, but who was saying the different points. So if there was a difference of opinion on the Bible, it was actually more about who said which part, who was on which sort of side of the Sorry, argument. Sorry, I don't quite understand what you mean there, who the biblical writer was or who the interpreter was. Oh, no, we didn't We didn't read biblical writers, David. <laughs> no, <laughs> <we're silly laughs> <men>. You know, <laughs> elder. Elder Alex and Elder, you know, Ro Roger ah, right. have a disagreement ah. on the Bible, and it was more about who who was your relative and who was on which side. Ah. Now, it's an, that's a very micro version of what effectively is going on in a lot of scholarship. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a kind of a shibboleth happening in many respects. Yep. You know, if you if you say this, you're on this team, and if you say that, you're on well, that team. Well, it is true where in any sort of theological or philosophical thing, but also in Scripture, that the way in which you read Scripture, you need to be um, – the, the technical word for it is what's the genealogy of this? Um, the question of where did my line of thinking come from? And yeah. it helps to a great degree to realise, oh, I've been reading X, but X was formed by Y, and behind Y was uh, was Z, and this tradition. Well, let's bring it. <laughs> let's bring it back okay. to our Catholic listeners and, and the people asking about Catholics and saying, "How do Catholics come to the Bible?" Because the accusation is that Catholics don't read the Bible. Mm. Now, of course, it's nonsense. But the question we have to look at the what's the truth behind the accusation, and the accusation is that in that period when there was a proliferation of translations in the vernacular in in common languages. Um, now, there, there wasn't that there were translations before this, by the way. There were plenty of translations out there. The Catholic Church voiced problems and concerns about translations which were done clearly with a bias, uh, 
clearly with an attempt to um, get across a certain point of view and sometimes just bad translations, and therefore they, they preferred to... And, and this um, wasn't only you know, Catholics that did this, um, Peter. The, the, um, no. there is a, the King James Version is actually officially known as the authorised version, and the reason was right. that King Henry VIII authorised it because it was translated in a way that bolstered his role <laughs> as the divine right king. But also it... it it dealt with the fact that there were many other versions which were causing trouble with the differences yeah, yeah. between them. The, the Geneva um, version. I mean, even even within, he was very much about order, so long as he was on the top of the order. Now, in the, in the terms of um, why this this accusation came out is that the the Catholics tended to be. A, I mean, they tend to be slow at everything in any case, but they they do tend to be slow in accepting uh, a new idea. So, for example, uh, the and there's a good reason for that. They don't just jump on every bandwagon as soon as it appears, because often those bandwagons are heading straight over cliffs. We're very cautious about the proliferation of, of unauthorized translations because it created lots and lots of crazy ideas which have now manifest themselves throughout the world in all kinds of different ways of understanding the scriptures. And, and we'd have to say with the the amount of Protestant churches out there, it's not been there's some advantages to the freedom of, of access to Scripture, but there are some disadvantages, and that is that the unity of believers has been severely compromised. Okay, so I think we, we need to backtrack a little bit here, um, and this is one difference between the experience of the Scriptures in the Protestant community and the experience of the Scriptures in the Catholic community. Primarily, Catholics do not experience the Scriptures as a text. Primarily, they experience it as something which is read to them and which they hear on a daily basis in the, in the liturgy. And but that's um, how the early church heard the scriptures, David. Exactly. I mean, it wasn't until the invention of the printing press that anybody had even the snowflakes chance in Hades of actually owning a copy of the scriptures, unless they were extremely rich. Well, before um, the printing press, you had to pay basically what's an equivalent of a college graduate approximately a year to copy the entire Bible out mm. for you, which is, you, you think of a starting wage for a college graduate these days, that's roughly the price of a Bible before the printing press. And mm, so mm. It, it just was beyond the reach of the ordinary person. So as you say, the only way that the first 1,600 years of Christendom uh, could hear the scriptures in, by and large, was to hear it in mass, usually, or and, and, in in some sort of private education. And you by cannot the underestimate the difference in experience between reading a text visually and hearing it orally. A different thing happens entirely. And for anybody who loves listening to podcasts or reading or listening to audio books, I know you're not such a fan of this, Peter, but I'm a big fan of doing this. I <laughs> convert all my my texts immediately into audio and listen to them as I go bushwalking. The um, to listen to something often gets in deeper than reading it does. And what Catholics have does it depend on your personality, though, David? We'll move on from that. What, what, what happens <laughs> when you when you hear these texts read over and over again to you orally in your experience in the liturgical context is they get in like liquid into the chalk in a way that doesn't necessarily happen textually. When you read something textually, you're reading it consecutively, whereas there is a holistic um, experience of the text, especially in the liturgy, when you actually put an Old Testament text next to a New Testament text next to a gospel text, and that they interact and talk with each other, you get a conversation right. happening. The word homily, for instance, is the old word for a conversation, and a conversation happens oh, really? between sermone is the same thing, whether it's in Greek or in Hebrew. Sermon and homily means a conversation. A conversation takes place with the text. And I would say this is right. the experience to a large extent of most Catholics, many Catholics who would not pick it up daily. Now, that's not to say that Catholics don't use the scriptural texts. But again, another place where a lot of Catholics, especially those rediscovering the church's ancient method of prayer, would come across the scriptures is through the daily office of readings. Um Yes. Yep. Now, this is this is the thing I wanted to pick up on. It, it, when people accuse Catholics of not using scripture, firstly, ninety percent of liturgy is scripture for starters. 
and that that's constantly uh, happening, literally lived out in in the church's some. Um, understanding and the liturgy of the church itself which is something we're going to get into in future episodes comes from the bible itself so that even the structure of our worship comes from the bible but then you have the priests are required not not you know recommended but required to pray the office three times a day which is literally the psalms and and other parts of scripture three times a day and a more extended reading once a day they're only recommended to say Mass, you know, strongly recommended to say Mass every day. And one of the things the church has always done is strongly recommend that the laity join the priests in this praying of the, of the scriptures each day as they are able to do. Now, in this, in the old days, as we said, no one could afford to. They didn't have the text. But honestly, your iPhone can pick up the, the daily readings very easily um, for a very low cost. Even before that, one of the documents that's come out from Rome consistently through the church's history is what's called a ratio, which is a document which says this is how priests are to be trained and this is these are the subjects they must study. And it, in the ratio for Australia and for the world, but Australia's interpretation of it, includes study of the biblical language, um, languages and study of the scriptures. There is a, and they have to cover quite a broad range of the scriptures. And I know this because we provide some of that training at the University of Notre Dame. And I know that you've been involved with some of uh, various training, theological training down in Melbourne, David. But the whole, the, the depth of the study of Scripture is so deep that Pope Benedict could actually say that the study of Scripture is the soul of theology, not just the foundation, not just the start, not even an important part of it, but the very soul of theology, the centre and heart of it, the, the living, breathing animation of theology, uh, the reason it's alive at all. Okay, so at this point, I think that Catholics do need to do a little bit of a mea culpa because we got to a point where the two studies of theology, uh, both dogmatic theology and scriptural theology, became separate, separated, and they do tend to continue to be separated in uh, Catholic schools of theology today. So someone will say, I'm a scripture scholar, not a theologian. and yes. um, Or a theologian might say, I'm not a scripture scholar, but... And you have to in ask fact, yourself... David, I can tell you that I'm routinely scolded um, because I, when I teach um, systematic theology, such as I have, and I teach marriage and sexuality, I'm routinely scolded that I bring so much scripture into it because that's not theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, look, this is a problem and we've got to overcome it. And Pope Benedict is absolutely right in saying scripture must be the soul of theology. Hmm. Well, it is. I mean, when you read any decent papal document, um, and by that I mean I've been reading them some from back from Leo the Thirteenth through to the current Pope. They begin with Scripture and they draw their theology mm -hmm. out of Scripture. It's they're not at all interested in posing particular views and then sort of finding a few verses here and there. The way Scripture is used is that it starts with a profound and deep relationship with Christ in the Scriptures, yeah. which then extends into an understanding which is played out in in in. Well, in their theology. Even St. Thomas Aquinas could have saved himself a lot of trouble and just adopted Aristotle holus bolus um, if it wasn't for the fact that what he was trying to do was understand the scriptures uh, through this philosophy. And so the entire mm. dialogue was a dialogue with the, with the scriptures and with his philosophical training. Speaking of St. Thomas, it brings us back to the question we raised earlier about the philosophy behind things. One of the things they never let us do as a Lutheran, and certainly we didn't do as brethren, was look at the philosophy with which we were approaching the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone thinks, oh, I don't have a philosophy because I haven't studied philosophy, but everyone has a mindset, a way of reading things, which not doesn't dominate, but it certainly sets the parameters by which we read things. Mm -hmm. So the Lutheran uh, church grew out of a time when nominalism, a certain type of philosophy, was dominant. And while they refused, and Martin Luther in particular refused to acknowledge philosophy as having an influence, in fact, he denied its influence and said it was a bad thing, Lutheran theology is dominated by that particular philosophy. Yeah, he didn't spring up uh, like a, a 
flower from the um, in the mud of weeds overnight. Yes, he didn't it? invent thinking by himself, yeah. <laughs> and he's very much dominated by our time. Now we have to acknowledge that a huge amount of what's going on in not just the Protestant churches, but in the Catholic churches and Eastern churches these days, the challenges that we're facing are largely to do with the fact that there's a new way of thinking mm-hmm. in the world. And that this way of thinking, whether we acknowledge it or not, has influenced the way we think about the Bible and about the whole world. Lots of people now are thinking about the Bible, for example, in light of Charles Darwin and in light of the cynical kind of text criticism which has come up in the last couple of centuries. And, you know, oh, is this really true? It's not literally true, you know, that kind of thing. Now, partially that's a misunderstanding of the word literal, um, but it's also the fact that we're not acknowledging how much influence our modern way of looking thing, at things is having on our reading of Scripture. When we talk about literal in the Catholic Church, we're not talking about um, just merely an assertion of a kind of physical facts. Like if we say Moses walked up to the hill, we're not saying, well, this means Moses literally walked up a hill. No, the literal meaning, according to the Catechism, and I think it's Catechism 116, It says the literal meaning of scripture is the meaning of the words discovered by exegesis, governed by the principles of sound interpretation. Now, what did the author intend us to understand by the words? And so when the author of Song of Songs, for example, says her hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead, he does not mean she has a goat problem. He's referring to poetically to the richness and the 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 curves and the and the black lustrous um, you know curls of her hair etc. Now it's quite clear that's what he means and that is the literal meaning. And so the question is we we have to actually work a little bit to try and understand the intended meaning of the author. Mm-hmm. Now underneath this meaning and I think contained within it are several other quite deep spiritual meanings and one of which is that we believe every text leads us to Christ, presents us with Christ, and Christ introduces himself and and gives himself to us in the text. We call this the allegorical sense. Then there's the moral sense, which is the lesson for life, the, the what does this mean for my daily life? Um, and then there's finally the, the looking towards the end. Where is it leading us, the anagogical sense? So there's these three deeper senses hidden within, not hidden often, just but off sometimes we have to dig a little bit within every text. But the literal meaning is not just the first thing that pops into my head when I read the text. It, it means we have to dig a little deeper. And that digging deeper can't be done um, by yourself. To quote the arch heretic Martin Luther, um, sorry, it was a bit of a dig. The most dangerous thing in the world as a Christian alone in a room with the Bible. Now, he doesn't mean you shouldn't do private private Bible study. He means that when you imagine yourself to be totally solo, that you are you have the sole task of interpreting the Scriptures by yourself with no help or guidance or wisdom from anyone else. That's a dangerous Actually, thing. It's funny that you say that because his arch um, nemesis, Erasmus, Catholic, actually had the hope that um, every man at his plough might have access to reading the scriptures. So it's funny to have these opposite ideas there. Um, let, let, let's keep going on this. Um, these four senses of scriptures as, as they're known in classical theology. So, so the literal sense, the, uh, the best thing that people yes. need to think of is, in fact, there are two senses of scriptures, a literal sense and a spiritual sense. And I've just pulled the yes. um, catechism up, and it is paragraph 116 in there, and it quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, go. who says, all other senses of Scripture are based on the literal sense. So that's always our start. Yes, in other words, you can't, you can't understand how a text refers to Christ or the moral life or to the future if you haven't understood the intended yeah. meaning of the author our, in the first anchor, place. Our yeah. anchor is in the letter of the text. From the- now, when we say literal, we need to be careful to, to describe what we mean by that, though, because often when people hear literal yes. sense, what they think we mean is the world was literally no, seven okay. 24-hour so days. The better the word making. than literal is literary. I, I think literary is mm. what we're, ta- we're talking about. The li- litera means those letters and, and the, in, in, the, in the writing, in the text, and that involves 
This is where you can bring in other things about what do we know about the writer, what do we know about the context, how does this text relate also, to what, other what texts. what do the words say? Yeah. I mean, David, honestly, when, when people insist on 20, 27, 24 hour days, you say, well, the sun appears in day four. Now, it's not that the Hebrew author has forgotten to mention the sun and <laughs> pops it in later in the text. He's put it there quite deliberately. Yeah. And one of the reasons he may have done so, I think, is to just make it clear that when he says the word day, um, yom in Hebrew, for the, the first three days, what he clearly does not refer to is the sun going up and the sun uh, going down. But at out. the same time, Peter, do we, we sometimes, you know, in a way, if we want – in an attempt to take the the text literally, you sometimes have Christians say, "Oh well, each day might mean actually an era or something like that." And you say, "No, no, Look, no! Stick could. with Look. the text. The text is talking about morning and evening. That's literally what the text is talking about." If you're looking for the connections with the rest of the Bible, you need to take the text at face yeah. value. So, for example. If you then, if you try and make it into seven eras or seven mm. millennia, or as some people put, seven mm. ages, um, then you've lost some of the yes. connections with the rest of the scriptures when they talk about seven which, days which or particular days week, or something course, like that. You know, and that, that the Indeed. week, seven day week, is um, a, a, a absolutely undergirds the, this Hebrew idea of the seven day week with the Sabbath at the end undergirds everything throughout Indeed. the Old Testament. So, so let's let's push on from here. So. The literal sense and the spiritual sense. You've essentially got two senses, but the spiritual sense mm. has three, uh, it traditionally is said to have three senses um, that work from there. And the those three senses are technically the allegorical sense, the moral sense, and what's called the anagogical sense or what leads us on towards Christ and towards the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, I know too, that mm. um, in our Protestant upbringing, um, we were pretty dark on allegory, on allegorical interpretations of the scriptures. And it Except is, that we use them all the time. Well, yes. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, and, the, and it has to be acknowledged there were some uh, quite enormous flights of fancy in the later antiquity as to ways that allegories were done. But mm. The scriptures themselves contain allegories. And I know that for a while, the parables, we were all taught, you know, the parables aren't allegories. But hold on a moment. Some of them are. Like the parable of the sower right. is absolutely <laughs> It's quite allegory. clearly. <laughs> um, there's, there's no doubt about that. So, you know. To bring it back to the, the, average, the average person reading their Bible the allegory is referring to where it teaches us something about the, the faith, the allegory of faith, and usually to do with Christ himself or the sacraments, grace, or something like that. The example um, given in the catechism is that the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, is an allegory of Christian baptism. And that's not one that the church has made up. That's one that St. Paul himself uses in 1 Corinthians. So, well, I, I would say the church has, in fact, bring it because St. Paul is, of course, one of them. Forgive me for that. I, there's a slip of the tongue there. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you another thing, because the first time I really became aware of different ways of reading, I mean, our evangelical friends who might be listening to this, you, you have a way of reading scripture, yes. Uh, the Catholic Church has a way of reading scripture in its tradition, yes. There's, in fact, another way of reading scripture out there at the moment, which is thoroughly academic. And uh, yes. the academic approach to reading scripture, um, some Catholics, and I'm again, this is a mea culpa, have forgotten our ancient way of reading scripture. I had a wonderful opportunity some years back to do a... Um, a study of Old Testament scriptural texts together with a Catholic scriptural scholar and with a rabbi, um, a rabbi right. of the professional, uh, sorry, of the, um, of the um, progressive uh, tradition. But nevertheless, the rabbi of progressive tradition taught us how to read according to the traditional orthodox means of reading the scriptures and you know something they've got these four senses exactly the same they've got <laughs> hebrew words for them 
And right. um, it, they are exactly the same as our literal, allegorical, moral, and anagogical. It was used by the rabbis in the period of um, antiquity and late antiquity during the formation of the rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism. And Christian church fathers used exactly the same scheme. They agreed they on how this was to be read. Um, well, to be honest, well, it I'll, comes I'll back to the what story, our friend finishing the story. So then, then when the the Catholic scholar got up, it was all about the academic um, readings, you know, um, source criticisms, right. and all the rest of it. And the rabbi said, "Hold on a minute, we're not playing the same game here." Um, I could have yes. done that too, but I didn't. I'm sticking with our tradition. Yes. Well, I mean, part of it is that. The scriptures are difficult to understand if you just sit by yourself in a room with the Bible. Mm. Um, and I, I know a good many Catholics, and, in, and certainly the ones who've first begun in my classes, are often a little bit scared of opening the Bible. Sometimes because they think they'll get it wrong, and they'll there'll be some sort of, um, you know, God won't like them or something like mm. that. And others are scared they might become Protestant if they read the Bible mm. too much. But the the scriptures are precisely why I am a Catholic. That. The, I certainly wouldn't have become a Catholic if I thought they were in any way against it or even indifferent to it. But coming back to um, those, the way Catholics read the scriptures now, I think that part of the problem is, as you say, if you go looking for people to help you read the Bible, what you get, get is either someone who's very heavily influenced by the Protestant traditions um, and is anti Catholic, or you have someone who's so scholarly that. A, it's just not interesting anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, it seems so Drained vague and uncertain. <laughs> yeah, and they take all of the – and this is the thing I have a problem with, and I'm going to say this clearly. Isol's translation, the, the, cho the choices that are made to omit certain texts in the Sunday readings and in the, in the office of readings, yeah, they've taken the difficult things out, though. They've taken the – like at the end of Psalm 137, for example. Oh, yes. Um, the – the the <laughs> difficult parts, the bits that are hard and gritty and difficult, and and, and oh, ooh, we don't want to read that in front of children. Yes. Yeah. So the entire kind of niceness of Western civilization, or perhaps Anglo more than Western, um, comes through in that. But we we're actually not helping people by not letting them engage with scriptures in all their difficulties and hard, like when they address hard situations, when um when things get. Interesting. I was having this conversation with them um, in my, the previous podcast with my brother about the Song of Songs and that it's very rarely read in its full kind of glory. Whereas, as I understand it, the Shepardic Jewish tradition reads the Song of Songs in its completion. Yes. Um, every Friday night in anticipation of the Sabbath. The Jewish tradition of reading scriptures, their lectionary is continuous. So there's actually yes. they they've got a big scroll of the Torah and every Sabbath the Torah is broke whole Torah whole five books of Moses are broken into um how many 52 different sections and every Sabbath a, a section of it is read and so at the throughout the year the scroll gets unrolled and then there's a whole festival at the end of the year, in the new year, part of the um, uh, um, the, the, the Rosh Hashanah, the, the um, Jewish New Year, where they have the re-rolling of the scroll back to the beginning. It's beautiful. It, 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 everything is taken in its course. Now, we've got to wrap this up pretty mm. soon. We're a bit over time. So perhaps if we can come back to the emphasis that Catholics are steeped in Scripture, they read and hear Scripture in the way it has been heard yes. all of the Christian church's life. Uh, and now actually, so so I I will say that something we have to take into account here is that when we talk about the way the Catholic Church reads Scripture, we don't just talk about the Catholic Church from the time of the 16th century. We are taking into yes. account the way that the Church has done this for 2,000 years. We believe that Indeed. what we are doing, and we don't just believe that, we can demonstrate that what we are doing with the scriptures is what the community of Christ has done with the scriptures for 2,000 years. And I think that, that's really important to say. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good time to wrap it up, to be honest. You've just wrapped up what I was trying to wrap up. <laughs> so that's all for now. Um, that's it for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with your device, let us know. 
You can hit us up at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, all the usual places. Leave us a review. But remember, this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast. We think that's a good idea. So tell your friends. We'll be back next week, but that's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. Music.